Welcome, here are some slides about quantum calculus. It was presented on March 10th at the Wolfram uh, Physics Seminar. While I'm primarily a teacher, I also like to experiment mostly with a computer and this since many years. You see here a few stations. <clears throat> I talk today from the Science Center in Cambridge. I also recently started to take some pictures with a drone. I'm located in the fourth floor of that stair-shaped building. First, something about the methodology of science in general. While at ETH we had to take a semester course, each semester a course in the philosophy department, Abteilung 10, I think it was called. One semester I followed the lecture series by Paul Feyerabend. Limits of science. Uh, he's an enfant terrible in science, an anarchist. But I liked the lively discussions. Almost everybody attacked his point of view, but that made it interesting. Anything goes. Every, a friend of Feyerabend, Imre Lakatos, also hinted at the diverse landscape uh, of theories. Might not be wrong, but inconsistent. This is a very modern approach if one looks at. What Gödel did in logic, we have to exclude theories producing inconsistencies and not theories a priori. There could be several based on different axiom systems. Also, the historian Thomas Kuhn stressed that uh, it is a delusion that the scientific community at the time knows what the world is like. Indeed, historically, the mainstream community often was proven wrong by future developments. Not only theory, but also a framework of language is important in science. Developing a good language is even more valuable because it allows us to build many theories. Uh, one of my heroes is uh, Brian Kernighan, founder of Unix, C programming language, the paradigm simplicity, clarity and generality is extremely powerful also outside of computing. Let me illustrate this with an example. The click problem in graph theory is a famous NP-complete problem. The problem is to find the largest click, complete subgraph in a network, so also a more general problem to count the number of all clicks is difficult. So we, the simplex generating function is a, contains all these numbers, the number of F0, the number of vertices in F1, the number of edges, F3, the number of triangles, etc. This produces then a function. This function can be generated using the gauss bonnet theorem. The idea is that we can look at the antiderivative of the simplex generating function of a unit sphere as a curvature. You see that here and two lines of Mathematica are enough to actually compute without any libraries this uh, simplex generating function. So here's the theorem, theorem written down in a more compact form. 1 minus uh, f minus 1 is the Euler characteristic. So this is the gauss bonnet theorem for simplex generating functions. We'll be come back to this. In the continuum, this is a much more complicated result. So the notions are you know, involved the metric g, the connection gamma, the Riemann curvature tensor r, the Pfaffian, which is the curvature double summation over permutations. Quite complicated. This is a big deal historically. I mean, it has been started with Gauss in 1827 and culminated with Chern in 1944. It's a nice theorem in differential geometry. But graphs are nice and can uh, one can replicate lots of theorems also in graph theory. And uh, graphs are for me just a, a structure which also comes with the simplicity complex, the Whitney complex, the complete subgraphs. And so in this case, these Archimedean solids, this is all the 12 Archimedean solids, solids, these are actually not spheres. We don't look at the ambient space or anything. Uh, so uh, the graph itself should determine the geometry. And uh, in this case, there are no triangulations of a sphere. But for the, for the Catalan solids, the, the dual graphs, we have two cases where we have really a, a sphere, where the geometric realization of the Whitney complex produces a sphere, otherwise not. It's something about the notion of finitism, the rejection of infinity. A computer scientist is naturally a finitist. So Doron Zahlberger once pointed out, uh, we are fooled by, we, and we think that the, the discrete is approximating the real world. <clears throat> I usually do not animate people who are alive, but Zahlberger, with a sense of humor, certainly would not mind. <clears throat> not stick with the discrete. Ed Nelson once gave a good reason. Mathematicians are conservative by nature and do not adapt new results if they are not uh, powerful enough immediately.
Nelson also constructed a nice non-standard analysis flavor, which is very powerful. So here is the book, his book, Radically Elementary Probability Theory, where all probability theory is based on finite sets. Urge to harmonize the continuous and the discrete, so uh, to eliminate obscurity from both. So that's this in his book. Uh, uh, first ultra was probably Leo Leopold Kronecker, who said God made the integers, all else is the work of men. And uh, uh, there was a, a later Paul Kustan Hamo mused about the possibility to change the real numbers to a finite field. I learned about this in college from Ernst Specker. So Kustan Hamo had been at ETH worked with Stiefel. This is a paper of Kustan Hamo from 19. 52 on the fundamental prime of a finite world. I myself learned also in college about finite approaches to dynamical systems by Jürgen Moser, who pointed out that simulations of a finite fields produce results in dynamical systems which look like the simulations done on the on the reels. So here's a paper of Moser where he shows a map, a Ranu map from a astronomer, and this is done over a finite over a finite field. The, the computation is done over a finite field. I just tried it out again, computed here a picture of the, sta the standard type map using a finite field arithmetic, and it looks like the, you see these calm islands and uh, unstable uh, sea, this chaotic sea. So how finite is finite? If you look up, you know, the number of particles, 10 to the 80 particles, we can say there's less than 10 to the 100 particles, less than 10 to the 200 Planck units in the universe, if you believe that just, the, you know, the smallest unit, 10 to the minus 35 meters, and 10 to the 80 meters cube is the volume of the universe. Also, the amount of information which we can store, right? The, the world has maybe 10 to the 21 bits currently, also the brain. Uh, has a finite amount of information. All life, maybe all together, has 10 to the 40 bits. So the, the, the numbers are finite. So it's natural to ask whether we can do physics in the finite. There are lots of approaches, and I might miss some. Actually, here's a, a couple of flavors. Uh, some of them are numerical schemes, like Recchi calculus or lattice gauge theories. For uh, In physics, numerical schemes in general, to, for PDEs or ordinary differential equations, loop quantum gravity is something, is an approach to, to combine quantum mechanics and, and gravity. Full, Wolfram physics is based on finite on hy hypergraphs. Uh, I mentioned already the radically elementary approach of Nelson. There is topos quantum gravity, which changes sets to more general objects like topos and uh, changes language, changes logic and uh, there's arithmetic topological quantum field series or finite fields where you have uh, more number theoretical schemes. Uh, but the difficulty is well known, and this is expressed by one of the topos quantum gravity researchers, Cecilia Flory. The problem is to combine QR and, and GR. The scope is beyond experiments. I myself want to explore examples of discrete theorems, whether it has a relation with physics is not that important for me. Arnold, one of my heroes, uh, as I grew up in dynamical systems theory, once pointed out that mathematics is part of physics where experiments are cheap. Uh, I would rather say it differently and say physics is part of mathematics where experiments are expensive. And indeed, if you look at the, you know, the toys which have been built, like LIGO, the, the web telescope which has just gone up, Sasso for neutrino, or the, the, the Large Hadron Collider, these are billions and billions of dollars, which try in physics to get new phenomena using experiments. Uh, for me, it's also including numerical experiments, so I'm, in some sense, it, experimental mathematics is physics, and then build mathematical models to understand the, the phenomena. And one of the big riddles I learned from Ernst Becker, another teacher of mine, and he said it's strange that discrete systems like fluid dynamics are described by continuum PDEs, but then discretize for numerical purposes in the computer. So we go from the discrete to the continuum, and then again in the discrete. Specker is also known uh, in physics for the Koch and Specker theorem. It's actually affinities theorem. It's a completely discrete. You can formulate it over a finite field. It, if the dimension is three or larger, then you cannot build a function, a value function, which is compatible with multiplication and with a, a functional calculus, function on self-adjoint operators. Uh, physicists like Dirac pointed out that 
you know, the methods which theoretical physicists are using might not be the correct method. Especially. So when do we know to have a valued model? Model, <coughs> this is uh, tricky. And uh, you might have heard about the story of Pauli dismissing the proposal for nuclear uh, interaction coming from the exchange of vector bosons. We call this proposal ridiculous or not even wrong in his seminar. And the person who he down like that is uh, was a Swiss mathematician Ernst Stückelberg. And Richard Feynman, who lectured at CERN to an audience which included Stückelberg, said uh, Stückelberg did the work and walks alone toward the sunset. And here I am covered in all the glory, which rightfully should be his. It's sometimes difficult to really assess when something is uh, right, or, uh, especially in physics, when experiments are not yet uh, available. So I wrote uh, recently just a page about Trickleberg. It's a fascinating story. I have heard general relativity and quantum mechanics is their grand unified theory, a theory of everything. So here are some example structures which are finite. Again, these are just a slice. There's finite fields. We have mentioned this with Kustan Haimo. The spin networks, which were considered by Penrose, directed multigraphs, that's the Wolfram physics project, and some tried to enrich lo logic and mathematics using category theory, like the topos theory, sets, generalized maybe Brish fiefs, which are also topos, Boolean algebra is a place to hate in algebra, more general logic, or non-standard analysis, which extends the axiom systems. It's a consistent extension of the uh, our usual uh, axiom system, classical mathematics on steroids. M my own uh, uh, approach is more modest, so to explore combinatorial versions of theorems corresponding to theorems in classical theories, look for interesting classes of graphs and study functional on these classes with the hope to find interesting maxima and minima, or to look for dynamical systems on graphs and study whether some quantities have limits or universal features. In the context of calculus, this brings us to topics close to what uh, I'm teaching. So calculus combines derivatives and integrals to look into the future, predict the future. Uh, if we refuse taking limits, we get quantum calculus. So there are also here different uh, flavors and uh, approaches. Some of them are numerical, some number theoretical, some combinatorial. We should also point out practical reasons to stick to the finite, like the data finite. Uh, so business calculus, for example, you know, we should just deal with spread spreadsheets. So computer science, everything is given by finite data. For me, theorems are important, uh, so I, I collect them. I just want to illustrate this with a few adaptations of continuum theorems to the discrete. First, uh, the definitions. I need a few definitions which define differential forms, and graphs are then the play the role of the space. And uh, we can then, uh, with an exterior derivative, we have, a, for example, cohomology uh, groups or Lefschetz numbers. And so here are six theorems. I'm not going much into them, but I illustrate three of them. Integrals are finite sums. So I just write integral sign instead of the sum sign. Theorems are very close to the continuum. Actually, they imply the continuum results. The Stokes, Poincare, Hopf, Gauss, Bonnet, the Saar theorem, the McKean Singer symmetry, and the Brauer Lefschetz fixed point theorem. So, about Stokes, that's what we teach in calculus uh, courses. By the way, these graphics were done using uh, Mathematica, but it's a, it's a theorem which directly goes over to graphs. We have a manifold with boundary, and then we have differential forms, which are functions. Functions on edges, these are one forms. Functions on triangles, these are two forms. Functions on iterator are three forms. So we can, we can, uh, we have the exterior derivative, which have diff grad curl. And uh, so this can be done in calculus courses, also in the discrete. For example, here we see a graph and we see a one form function on edges. And then we can look at the df, which is the curl, just integrate around the triangle, we get the curl, or we can take the divergence, we just look up what comes into a node, comes and goes out into a node, that's the divergence, and so on. So we have all the notions which we have in the continuum, we have can also do here. It's all discrete, all finite. About gauss bonnet we have a curvature which is uh, uh, given as a summing up uh, cardinalities uh, defined by the unit spheres, have the Euler characteristic, is can then be expressed using these uh, numbers. And uh, more generally, we can take the simplex generating function of uh, 
graph and we can compute that using uh, recursively using the simplex generating function of the unit uh, spheres. So here are some examples. So we see a tree, see the curvatures to, to the right, and the tree has always other characteristic one. Another example is, is a disk, a discrete disk, and uh, we see also the curvatures here. Actually, uh, to the right is a disk. To the, to the left, this is not a disk because there are lots of holes here. There are no triangles. This is actually a one-dimensional graph here. So the Euler characteristic is minus 15. Uh, then we have a, here, we see a random two-sphere. The Euler characteristic is two. And uh, the curvatures add up to two. An example of a three-dimensional uh, manifold, three-dimensional sphere. And uh, uh, It's interesting that the curvature is constant zero there. I noticed that all for... Uh, odd dimensional manifolds, the curvature is always zero everywhere, constant zero. Proof that later. And uh, the other characteristic of an even dimensional sphere is two, like for a, this is a random four sphere. So in two dimensions here, again, an example which uh, shows a, a, a geometric realization of a two dimensional sphere. So we see the curvatures are mostly zero. These are blue points. Then we have 30 points with curvature one third and 12 points with curvature minus one third. So they add up to. Two. This is a very old theme in two dimensions, 150 years old. Eberhard, I will mention Eberhard. And so this is an interesting case where we have a product graph of two, the Shannon product of two graphs, and then the curvature is multiplied. I, I've proven that last year. By the way, Shannon not only produced entropy, but also produced a, a, a product for graphs, which is very natural, and started to hint at the, for an arithmetic of graphs. And uh, so here, uh, recently, I was flying over the house, uh, the entropy house. That was the house where Shannon lived in Winchester. The left shed's fixed point theorem also a simple result, but uh, it it looks and uh, is like the classical theorem. The sum of the indices of the fixed points is equal to the left shed's number, which is the supertrace of the induced map on cohomologies. If we see here an example of a graph which is contractible, in the case when the graph is contractible, the left shed's number is one, so there is, exists always a fixed uh, simplex. So that's the Brouwer fixed point theorem. So if you have a graph which is contractible, there is at least one simplex fixed. About SAR theorem, this is totally amazing because in the discrete, when you look at level surfaces of a manifold, this we get just the lower dimensional manifold if, if the value C is not a value which is taken on the on the vertices. So there's never any singularity like in the continuum. D-dimensional manifolds are defined recursively as graphs for which every unit sphere is a D minus one sphere. <clears throat> A Kinsinger, it's another result, which is if you look at the non-zero eigenvalues of the even forms and the eigenvalues of the odd forms, they agree, and uh, so they come in pairs, which is very useful. For example, you can express this as a supertrace of the heat uh, kernel is always the Euler characteristic. Supertrace of one is the Euler characteristic by definition. Uh, let's look a little bit at single variable. The founders, uh, like Leibniz or Gregory, have... Uh, have already developed this. So here's the fundamental theorem of calculus. And when you take the derivative of the sum, you get the function back. If you take integrate up the derivative, you get the difference of this function values. Uh, Leibniz actually, I want to say Leibniz already, when he understood this, finally, actually expressed this also in a discrete way. And, uh, here is the proof of the first result. That was in 2013. And uh, this is Taylor's theorem. Also, Taylor's theorem is in general, true for any function, doesn't need, need any regularity if you look at the discrete. And uh, this Taylor no, series is actually, has been known by Newton and Gregory already. And uh, one of the most important principles uh, in physics is that uh, laws are obtained from functionals. All classical theories are like that. And so it's natural also on graphs, so, you know, discrete objects to look at functionals. These are functionals I've looked at, especially Euler characteristic dimension. You can look at the inductive dimension. Wu characteristic, which generalizes chromatic number, has been considered for very long, independence number for a very long time. You can look at uh, spectra, you can look at characteristic lengths, the sum over all possible lengths, the trees, the number of trees, spanning trees, the number of spanning forests, torsion, something I looked at recently. And then you, you can wonder what is the maximum, where is the maximum, for which graphs do you, with n vertices, is the maximum, which ones have the minimum, maybe. Also an interesting principle, and 
is to look at the geometry kind of using some kind of map that's also in the Wolfram uh, physics project appearing that you are looking at some kind of uh, r rules which take you one object and gets you a new one this produces then maybe some type of uh, universality. My PhD advisor was Oscar Lanford who proved the Feigenbaum uh, the, the, the Feigenbaum uh, conjectures and this is a, a renormalization picture which is very simple you look at maps on the interval and you see this universal extremely simple example but hard to hard to show it much easier is uh, when we look at if we look at barycentric refinement of uh, graphs and it actually leads naturally to piatic geometry so uh, piatic geometry is actually very very intriguing and there is piatic physics also so instead of looking at uh, the the real numbers and then you can look at the uh, the integers in these real numbers and the quotient which is the which is the circle which is a compact space so you have this duality between the circle and the integers and uh, the real numbers are self dual and uh, in the periodic world, it's uh, similar. So we have a compact space, the, the compact space of uh, uh, periodic integers, and then dual uh, space, which is a prefer uh, group. Uh, and we have, this is discrete, they are dual to each other. The periodic numbers, QP, which is a field, uh, which is self dual by a theorem of Tate. So it's a very similar story, but in, this, in the periodic case, there's just kind of the smallest unit, you know, the integers, when you take the completion with respect to the periodic norm, you get the periodic group of integers. So the, the integers are the smallest translation there. It's very uh, interesting. And uh, this appears when you look at the barycentric limits of, uh, of uh, geometry. So you take a graph and you look at the barycentric refinement, you look at it again and again and again. again. What you get in the limit is something uh, very interesting and not understood yet. It's only in one dimensional case we can really understand this is in three dimensions. Uh, you can do that in any dimension, so you can do it also for any graph. And uh, this is what you see in two dimensions when you look at the eigenvalues of the, you know, see here the Kirchhoff Laplacian, but you could take also the Hodge Laplacian or any kind of local Laplacian. And uh, if you look at the eigenvalues, they converge to, to a picture which is independent of the graph you start with, as long as the dimension is two, as long as there is a triangle in it. And if you turn it around, then you get the integrated density of states, and the density of states then is uh, the derivative, which we don't know what kind of type of measure this is. Maybe, maybe it's uh, maybe there are some point uh, eigenvalues. Maybe maybe not. Maybe it's probably singular continuous. So here is the kind of you see if you look at experiments and you look at this kind of uh, you know finite uh, uh, graphs, you look at the, the picture of the, uh, the the spectral pictures, and this converges then to this to these limits. Years ago is that if you look at from, if you go from in incidence to intersection, you get some regularity which is unexpected. Like you take this matrix which when two simplices intersect, two complete subgraphs intersect, you take one and otherwise zero. And then this is a matrix which actually has a, a, a inverse, which is an integer value. The determinant of the original matrix L was uh, in either one or minus one. Very surprise, big surprise, and this actually kind of so bounded green functions is really something exciting in, in physics because green functions play such an important role in, in physics. So that changes, that, that picture changes. We don't have cohomology anymore, but there is a, there's, there's a, there's, there's, there are nice Laplacians. And finally, something about can we see whether space is discrete? So uh, are there detectable features which, of discrete space? People have uh, thought about this, and uh, so s s some of these features look, you know, maybe they're too small to be seen because this is on a, on a, on a Planck's, Planck scale. But there are geometric uh, indications. First of all, just I want to illustrate this with a theorem, Eberhard's theorem that was 150 years ago. I like Eberhard because he was a blind mathematician, blind geometer, pretty amazing. And he proved an amazing theorem that if you have take a two-dimensional sphere and you take the I mean, two-dimensional graph, which is a which is a sphere, and that you take you look at the curvature configurations, and uh, they sum up to two, then you can realize this. And surprisingly, this depends on the topology. It doesn't work, say, on a two torus, which has been uh, discovered only in the 70s. So on a two torus, there is a, for example, the, the, the curvature can be constant zero. 
that's possible for the Taurus. I mean, the, 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 the other characteristic is zero, but there is not that it's not possible that you have one point curvature one six and one point curvature minus one six. This is a constraint. And uh, you can look at this also uh, by just looking at the discretization of space. You just look locally what happens uh, there. So these are pictures, you see kind of these defects. And uh, you see that maybe you just look at the lower right uh, example where we have such a situation with the left is uh, curvature one six and the lower right is curvature minus one six. But if you look at the triangle, which is going around, then uh, this is this, this is not an equilateral triangle. So one side is a little bit shorter. Uh, so you might just if there such defects uh, exist, maybe with, uh, with with some density, that you can actually see something like this that you look at the, a, a large triangle and you look at the angles and you look at the lengths and to see uh, of course that's disturbed also by the curvature <laughs> so by by other curvature but you would do that in a complete vacuum and see 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 what happens this is a this is a, 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 an amazing uh, discrete uh, you know miracle so in the continuum of course, you can realize any curvature uh, with, which adds up to uh, which adds up to zero. You can also locally just change the curvature in, in a rather arbitrary way. But that's kind of the situation where you are in the discrete, where you have uh, this kind of uh, manifestation of something which is it's locally disturbed from, but it's it it should be globally flat, right? Because the the Gauss, Gauss Bonnet, uh, this, uh, this dis disturbance should not, this should not matter. Okay, uh, let's give the last word to Emily uh, uh, Dickinson, who I also tried to animate here. He recently uh, went to Amherst and got a flower from her, but she has a nice, she has some nice uh, po poems. Also, this is uh, the Emily Dickinson, our Emily Dickinson flower a descendant of a flower of her garden in Amherst. And that's it. <clears throat>